All right, um, we're going to get started. I think it's one after. So thanks so much for being here. My name is Jeremy Hetzel. This is Student Leadership 101. And this is a topic that I have grown a lot in in the last eight or nine years, um, but something that I have become very passionate about. Um, so my plan is to kind of walk us through information that I have learned. Um, but I'd love you to just take a second to look on the WOVA app. I had some questions on there. Um, as polls, so as I am sharing a little bit, um, I kind of just want to know what context most of us are coming from, and if there are um, specific things that you're hoping to learn. So where do you serve students? What encouraged you to attend? Like, what? why are you interested in being in here? And if there's anything specific you're hoping to learn, um, I'd love to get some of those answers, just so that as we go through, I can try to make sure I'm hitting stuff that is beneficial to you. Um, but generally, um, as you're filling that out, I'll give you a second, but then I'll, uh, I like to share a little bit about myself and my family um, so that you kind of know who is talking to you, um, and then we'll kind of jump in. So take a second, answer those poll questions, and then we'll go. Where do you where do you primarily? So it looks like we have fourteen on the church side, two on the school side. Someone just said, "Why? What encouraged you to attend?" I love you. I'm very, <laughs> I'm very blessed. <laughs> I'm very honored. Awesome. Um, Cool. Okay. Cool. Um, I will try to, hopefully a lot of what we will go through today will be helpful in terms of um, what we're trying to what I can share will be helpful to you, is what I'm hoping. Um, so this is a little bit, bit about me. This is my family. We took this um, December 31st. Um, these two in the top corner are my brother Josh and his wife, and the rest are my family. Um, my bride, Susan, there on the left with the black hat, and I have six kids. Um, we are very blessed. Skylar on the top with the white hat, she's 16. Um, Savannah, almost 14. Riley, 12. Owen, almost 9. Hallie, almost 5. Hallie is nine, uh, Emma is nine months. Whew. So it's a pretty fun spectrum of 16 to nine months. Um, we, when we do stuff at our church, um, we have kids in all the age groups, which is really helpful. So we know everything that's going on. We know all the kids. It's fun. Um, I serve in Colorado Springs here at Family of Christ. I've been there 12 years um, and just been really blessed. Um, it's great to find a church where, where you fit really well. So, um, this is a little bit of stuff that I like. Um, Boston Red Sox, I was born in Philly, and I lived in Connecticut for age, from age 3 to age 10. So I come by my Red Sox fandom honestly. Um, I went to Fenway a couple times when I was a kid. Um, Marvel Studios, I just really love um, a bunch of their movies through Phase 3. <laughs> I don't really know about phase four. It's still kind of iffy. Um, I might go see Ant-Man tonight. I don't know. We'll see. Um, raising Canes, like legit yes. chicken. I used Ch Chick-fil-A was my favorite. And I told, if anyone knows Michael Winkler, I told Michael Winkler, like, no, Chick-fil-A is the best. And he said, no, Canes is the best. And I was like, I don't even know what you're talking about. What's Canes? <laughs> and then Canes came to town and opened a restaurant. And I was like, 
Oh, Canes is better. Yeah. <laughs> I really like Canes. Um, Wing Feather Saga. Anyone read those books? Um, Andrew Peterson, um, Christian artist. Um, like, if if I had to say, what is a what is today's Chronicles of Narnia? It's Wing Feather Saga. Um, anyone watch The Chosen? So Angel Studios is who has put together The Chosen is making an animated series of Wing Feather. And they've released the first four episodes. And my kids and I watch it every time there's a new one released. Super fun. Um, I like Arnold Palmer's. They're fun. Listen to Adventures in Odyssey all the time when I'm driving my kids home from school. We have the Adventures in Odyssey Club and listen. Um, favorite books I've probably read possibly ever. Um, the Ryro Revelations. Um, long story short, it's just about a, a, um, a mercenary. Um, who is like the nicest guy you'll ever meet and a thief who is like, whoa, scary. Um, and they're a team and just some of their adventures. And the, the dude, there's two books in each of these books. Um, so there's six. And he wrote all six of them before they got published. So it's really cool how like they interact and stuff. Anyway, I love Red Robin. Um, I love The Princess Bride. This app over here is called Libby. You can listen to audiobooks for free. And I listened to As You Wish recently, um, and it has people like Harry Ulwes, or however you say his name, and a bunch of other people from the movie, like, speaking in it, saying stuff that they said. So it's fun to kind of listen to audiobooks. Dr. Pepper's awesome. Oatmeal cream pies are healthy because they're oatmeal and cream. <laughs> um, so it's a good breakfast food. Um, Psych is, like, my favorite TV show ever. If you haven't ever seen Psych, if you like just silly banter, um, it's the best. And then I'm a huge Spurs fan. I grew up in Arkansas, started liking baseball and uh, basketball when David Robinson was playing and started cheering for them before I, they'd won any championships. And uh, I just still love them, even though they're not good right now. Um, but talking about the Spurs, um, in October, since I'm in Colorado Springs, in October of 2013, they did training camp at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. So the whole team, they lost... Um, gave seven of the finals against the stupid heat um, in like June of that year because of what's his name hitting this three-pointer when he's running and traveling and he wasn't really traveling I was just mad um, but so to kind of regroup after that grueling finals loss um, coach pop who went to the Air Force Academy um, did training camp in Colorado Springs at the Air Force Academy, and I have a friend who works there, and he was like, dude, there is a um, cadets-only practice, but, but I think I could get you in. You want to come? And I was like, yes, and so I did, and I tried to blend in. I wore a green shirt. Um, <laughs> but I did not blend in. Um, many of them were in their fatigues. And uh, I stuck out like a sore thumb, but I was there. <laughs> and this is a still shot of the championship video because they won in 2014. So I think me being in there was incredibly inspirational <laughs> and helped them win their 2014 championship. So it's kind of a claim of fame that no one knows about that I like to, like to talk about. So you, you filled it out a little bit on the... Um, the poll, but I'd just love to hear a couple things. Why did you choose this session? What are you hoping to learn? Why are you in here? Is there something specifically about student leadership that you want to learn um, or teaching leadership or that type of stuff? Why? What's something you're hoping to get out of our time together? For anyone who wants to share. Besides people who just come because they love me. I, I think it's while our culture changes and our students are changing and how you, things that they're interested in and how they communicate and relate to the world around them. There's, I think, some timeless truths about yeah. leading students that doesn't change. So I think that's yeah. my motivation for cool. being here. Agreed. How do you equip and develop leaders? Yeah. It's hard to do it if you don't know how. I felt that way a long time ago. Uh, encouraging the student leaders, uh, even you know, things don't go so well for them or wouldn't fail. Yep, because they will. Which is okay. Cool. Any others? Cool. All right. So I want to share a little bit about my journey. 
My first three summers at Family of Christ, um, these are teams that I took on mission trips. So my first summer, I'd been there for about six months. We got this trip planned. We used YouthWorks. Took, I think, 11 kids. Um, we went to Las Vegas in July. It was crazy hot. Um, the next summer, we were going to go to San Francisco, and I had a bunch more kids that were interested, and so we added a trip to L.A. Um, and teamed with uh, the rescue mission out there. Um, and that was really good. But I started sensing especially with some of my younger kids, that they were going to be looking for something more. Um, so this summer, we took two teams to Montana. And this whole time, even though we saw a lot of students engaged and excited about serving, I knew that as they hit their junior year, senior year, they were looking for more. And specifically, I knew that because some of these girls right here, these were eighth graders when I started. Um, and so then three years later, they were sophomores, finishing sophomore year. And they were just leaders. They were craving more opportunity. And I didn't have a way to provide that for them. And we had done youth works for the previous three summers, right? Um, and I started to realize that as much as it was great meeting other people, and getting opportunities for students to serve in different locations. Once you had kind of done a youth works trip, you had done all of them. Um, same type of experience, same type of expectations, and they wanted more challenge. And so thankfully, in 2014, we did our first trip with Leader Treks. So I'm going to talk about Leader Treks a lot. Um, because I've been really blessed by them. I'm not paid by them. I have to say that I am not paid by them. Um, but they send me swag, like this shirt. Um, and I have this. You might see me walking around with this. It says Leader Treks on the side. Um, because um, I talk to people about it all the time. Um, because I think it's been a huge, huge blessing to our ministry. So, Leader Treks is all about youth ministry, but they're specifically about equipping students as disciples and leaders. So we did our first trip with them in 2014, took some of the students that had been on the previous summer's trips, and I was excited to see what happened. And when we finished that week, and I asked, like this kid Jared here, he had been with three different mission trip organizations, and Leader Treks being his third, and I asked, like, what, what, what was most meaningful to you? And he said, this experience. So I want to talk through what some of their trips look like and then expound on how we've tried to implement stuff they do on trip in our own ministry. So when we showed up our first night, this was Dayton, Ohio, um, the trip leader, uh, her name was Taryn, she said, okay, we're going to do a team builder. Um, and I think she primarily did that because she wanted to see who are the leaders in this group, right? You do a team builder, um, you gotta cross this chocolate river, there's crocodile, you know, like whatever, and you gotta walk and you only have seven boards, but you have to get 14 people on it, whatever it is, right? But you have to work together and you see who are the voices that are speaking up and leading and guiding and helping decisions be made. And so they identified Jared as one of those leaders, um, and I forget who else they picked, they might have picked, I don't remember who else they picked. Um, Nick, maybe. Um, and so they, they saw two people who were kind of natural leaders. And the next day at Worksite, they made them the Worksite leaders. So how Leader Treks works, um, students lead everything depending on the level of trip that you're on. So a typical trip, a mission-ready trip, um, we call it a level two trip, Students plan their own VBS before they go. So the Leader Trek staff will say, hey, okay, you're going to be in Dayton this week. You're going to be doing VBS at this church. And you need to plan a three-day, two-hour VBS. And so I picked Jared and Rachel. Right? No, right there. Um, I picked the two of them as VBS leaders. They had to plan the theme 
They had to plan the schedule, like what rotations are we going to have, what time are we going to rotate, and they had to split up the rest of the team into, hey, your Bible study team, your crafts, your games, etc. And they had to do all that work. And then when we showed up on trip, they led VBS. On top of that, um, they lead on worksite. So Jared got identified as one of the leaders, and so he was in charge of like the picket team. So we are going to start measuring and cutting pickets for our fence. And then Nick, or maybe it was Rachel, were in charge of um, starting to dig the holes for posts to go in. And on that first day, Jared is leading. Hey, team, this is what we're going to do, etc. And he gets some training from Leader Trek staff. But, but Sean is working with him. And so then on Tuesday, Sean gets promoted, and he is the picket guy. So he's had a day of experience. Um, he's gotten to experience what are we supposed to do, but he's still going to have problems to solve, etc. Um, but now he's been promoted. And in the same way, they lead in the kitchen. So um, you show up for breakfast, and there's a team that's supposed to be there. And one of them gets assigned, you're the leader, and that leader has to decide, okay, you're cooking the pancakes, and you're making the eggs, and you are setting everything up. And it's the leader's job to make sure breakfast gets made, it's edible, <coughs> and it's on time, right? So throughout the whole experience, students are leading lots of different stuff. And what leader treks call those things are leadership labs. Opportunities for students to kind of dig in and lead and create a safe space for failure and genuine ownership. There is so much anxiety today. There is so much, I'm not sure I can do that, I'm nervous about that. There is so much fear of failure um, that it's super important to create a safe space for that. And I have found that Leader Trex has done a great job of creating a space for students to be willing to try things. And often they'll say, I don't know how to do that. That's okay. Um, ask me questions. So the important thing, too, is that we don't jump in as adults and save them, right? So kid is in charge. He's making pancakes, um, and he is putting in tons of water. You'd go, oh, my gosh, that's going to run over the whole pan. <laughs> so you initially want to step in and be like, well, hey, hey, how much are you adding? You don't. You just sit there and, hey, Randy, what do you want me to do? Can, can you mix the eggs? Sure. And the kid's in charge. Um, I'll talk some more about some of that stuff as we go. But I think it's really important to have a safe place for failure because kids are going to fail. We all fail at stuff that we've never done. So how can we have a safe place to try something new? Um, some of the other components about a Leader Trek's trip, they have 45 minutes of quiet time every morning. Um, I'll talk about that in a little bit. And they also do um, team time at night, and you evaluate as part of that. And evaluation is an important part because it's this opportunity to say what's going well, what's not going well. And people can own their failures in front of the rest of the group, or people may not even realize that half they did failed. Man, yeah, we taught the kids the Bible story. They were running around the whole time. Like, out of the ten kids that were in there, one sat. <laughs> what can we do about that, right? So before we get into some of the nitty-gritty stuff about how that works or how you foster some of that stuff, I wanted to share some success stories. So Sarah, she went on our first trip. She got assigned to be the Bible study leader. She was the quiet, I'm not comfortable talking in front of people. Um, I struggle with that. I know the Bible a lot because I've been doing Awana for the last seven years, eight years. Um, so I know a lot of Bible and scripture, and so that's why I got assigned here, but I'm in charge. She showed up, and she was nervous. Um, I've never really led kids. This is kind of chaotic, because these kids are just kind of running around. And she was in charge. She, did, she came into the trip saying, I'm not a leader. Two years later, um, in Polly's Island, she was one of the two VBS leaders. Just the opportunity to step into and go, I, I did all right at that. Like, God can use me at that. And then in college, 
she was part of a camp that's near Colorado Springs. Um, and they have a ministry where they travel to other towns to do like camps. She was in charge. Um, this kid, Ben, he uh, was in All City Jazz Band. They did one All City Jazz concert. And he absolutely loved it. And he was bummed that they only had one concert. So he was just like, oh, man, I just wish we could do more. And then he kind of realized, I'm a leader. I have influence. I, I can do that. And so he called his teacher. He asked for the names of all the kids that were on the jazz, city jazz band, contacted all of them and said, hey, do any of you want to do some additional gigs? Got, I, I think it was three or four. And for the next two years, they did gigs around town. The library, the coffee shop. Um, he did all kinds of stuff like that. This girl, Mickey, here, um, she attended confirmation, was involved for the two years. As a freshman, kind of not involved. Um, was able to convince her to go on a mission trip. But she would have said, I'm not a leader. I'm quiet. I, I'm kind of bubbly, but I'm shy. Um, and so I like participating and helping, but I, that's about it. Um, started getting more and more involved, went on multiple mission trips, and as a senior, she was one of the co-leaders of a level three trip, which is where students lead the entire trip. So I talked about a level two trip. The higher level is you have two student leaders that are in charge of six teams of students. There's a food team that is in charge of all the food. They plan the menu, they tell you what quantities you need, and they purchase everything. Um, there's a worship team for your own team, there's the VBS team, worksite team, cleaning team, water team. Um, when we did our first level three trip, um, we flew into Honduras. Um, we're on this two-hour bus ride from the airport to a grocery station that's near where we're going to be staying. And on that trip, the two students that are in charge of the food, the food team, they have their menu, they're looking at it, they realize they have no idea how much to buy. They're like, yeah, we're going to have sandwiches every day. How, how many loaves do we need to buy? I have no idea. So they spent probably an hour of that trip, going through their whole menu and figuring out quantities for everything. We show up at the airport. They divide the team up, buy everything. Um, we're standing there at the checkout, and the leader trek staff there in Honduras um, is chatting with me, and he's like, hey, Jeremy, just so you know, we're going to run out of food on Thursday. And I'm like, what does that mean? Like, what? And he was like, we'll come back on Friday. Okay. Um, and he was right. We ran out on Thursday. Um, and so the students then, because they were supposed to try to make it to Saturday or Sunday, let's have enough food so we can go on the weekend, they had to take time away from being on the work site to go back, get more food, and then they spent the whole budget. They like bought like 16 peanut butters. And it was like, dear Lord, like we only used like three this whole last week, and you just like quadrupled it. Um, but we donated everything we didn't eat to the orphanage where we were staying. Um, but Mickey got the opportunity to be a level three trip leader. Um, and it really boosted her confidence. It really helped her see, hey, God can use me in certain ways. Um, she started going to Concordia Seward this last year. Um, um, and the Lord has now called her to be a DCE which I don't think she would have ever considered or thought if she hadn't had some opportunities of leadership to figure out, oh, here's some things that I can do. Okay, So we're, we're going to talk about some specific things that I've learned from leader treks that I think should be able to apply to anything that you want students to lead in your um, situations or capacities. So that first trip in Dayton, they taught all of our students the five tasks of a leader. Um, and this goes to something that Paul said a little while ago about, I, I don't know how to teach. Like, I remember thinking, man, I'd love to have a student leadership team. And I would sit with them and go, what do you want to lead? And they'd be like, a lock-in. 
And I'd be like, no. <laughs> what else do you want to lead? Uh, whatever. And I wouldn't know how to equip them well. And on this trip, they started teaching five tasks of a leader. So the first task of a leader is to determine the scope and goals, right? So thumb looking down the scope. What are we trying to accomplish? What are we trying to do? What's the purpose, right? Second, type in on a calculator, calculate people and resources. What do I need to get this done? Um, we'll use a lock-in example. If I want to plan a lock-in, we want to get a bunch of kids there. We want them to hear the gospel. We want them to have a lot of fun. Um, how many people do we need? We need at least 14 adults so they can stay up and I don't have to. Um, it's going to cost money. How much money do we need to be able to purchase um, food supplies? Are we going to rent a bounce house? You know, whatever. Calculate what you need. Once you've determined those things, then you have to cast vision. So this is number three. You're like casting like you are um, fishing. Um, cast vision. You've got to help people get behind what you're trying to do. What are you doing? Why do you want them to join you? So if you don't do a good job at casting vision, no one shows up. Um, I had one leadership team that was working toward um, planning a ski trip. They took a long time to get all the details together. They planned it. They realized it was on the back end of spring break. <laughs> Great planning. Um, and they started telling everyone about it two weeks before. They did not do a good job of casting vision. We had like four kids go and like two of them were from the leadership team. Not all the leadership team kids went. <laughs> So cast vision, you could, have had, you could have the greatest plan, you could know exactly what you need, but if you don't do a good job of casting vision, no one's going to participate. If you do a good job of casting vision, then when you are leading the thing, there's going to be obstacles. Um, the pizza that you ordered is going to be late. There's going to be a kid during dodgeball that runs so hard he breaks his arm. That did not happen. It did happen. Um... There's going to be stuff that you have to navigate, right? Stuff is not just smooth. So students need to understand you're going to hit bumps. You could have everything planned out perfectly, and you're going to still have stuff that goes haywire. That's okay. How are you going to handle it? How are you going to navigate around it? And then evaluate at the end. Um, LeaderTrex talks about specific ways um, and skills that go along with all these things, and I can point out where you can get some of that information. But evaluating is probably one of the most important. Um, at the t end of the night each night, we evaluate how did VBS go, how is work project going, how are our relationships with one another. Like, Let's evaluate how we are doing as a team. Um, and if you sense that there's a lot of kids that um, just not are motivated, hopefully someone brings it up. Like, why are we being so lazy, y'all? Like, we're here to serve the Lord and, and we're not doing it. Or, um, work project, um, we're just, we're moving slow. Or we're really building a relationships, which is really good, but we need to balance it with getting work done, etc. Like evaluate, take time as a group, and this is where you can have hard conversations. And, and a lot of times students just own it themselves. Like, I, I, I know I didn't do a good job of leading that transition at VBS. Like, give them space to just be real. Let's be honest. How are things going? Where can we improve? And then you do action steps as part of evaluation. What are we going to do tomorrow? Um, and action steps need to be, let, let's say LeaderTrex says that everyone needs to have a watch. So you have your watch. Everyone is hopefully synchronized. Um, and nothing starts until everyone is there. So breakfast doesn't start until everyone's there. Um, nothing starts. And if we are 10 minutes late to starting breakfast, our day is already late. Um, and if kids are constantly being late, then we spend less time on the work site. Um, it bumps into VBS time, etc. And so one of the things is, okay, if we're always running late, what can, what can we do about it? Some of the ideas that we've used is there's a kid who becomes the like five-minute caller. And his job is to pay attention. Hey, we got five minutes till breakfast. And he's just walking around. And whenever there's transition times, that's his job. And so the action step gets put in place, and then we evaluate, did the kid do his job or not the next day? And if he did, were we more on time? Did that work? If it didn't work, let's find something else that can help us. Let's find ways to improve. So five tasks of a leader. 
Um, I think this has been super helpful for me. <laughs> Just thinking about, okay, I'm trying to lead this new opportunity at church or whatever. Oh, what do I need to figure out? I just look at my hand. Uh, mission first people always is a phrase that they say all the time. And so by that they mean we have to say super focused on the mission while also being focused on people. They take this from Psalm 78, 72. Um, with upright heart he shepherded them and guided them with his skillful hand. So with upright heart, he shepherded them. He cared about the people around him. He cared about what they were dealing with, what was going on. He shepherded them and guided them with a skillful hand. He knew what his mission was and he knew what his purpose was. So this is an important aspect that I hear our students on teams um, saying as they spend time on trips or around me. Um, you got to focus on both. If you're super focused on mission, if you're only task oriented, you may get a lot of work done, but there will be a lot of people that will be unhappy. You haven't cared for your people well. You may have a team that has a bunch of relators um, who love talking and spending time together. Um, you will have a very strong team that is very um, connected, has a strong community, is willing to be vulnerable with one another. Um, but they're talking so much that it takes 14 hours to paint two walls. And you go, we're not, why are we here? So it's got to be a balance. Leadership is all about balancing. This is where we're headed. But if no one's following you, then you haven't shepherded them well. So mission first, people always. And they are always in tension. You may be super focused. Hey, we're going to stop work right now. We need to deal with this relational crisis. That's okay. Um, work is going slowly, but the team is really connected. Hey, we got to kick it into gear. We are leaving on Friday. Let's get this work done. So these, um, they have a lot of principles that they say a lot. This is one of them. Mission first, people always. The two tasks that any leader has to focus on, you got to be doing both. And I have found that our students that are like the top two on a level three trip where they're in charge of the six teams, um, this is one of the things that they struggle with the most because I think it's one of the things that we struggle with most. If I'm a relator, which I am, um, it's super easy to be focused here. And I don't focus on the task as well, which is why it's good to have a balanced team. But they need to be able to call out. The doer is going to be frustrated during evaluation because we're not working hard. Give him space to speak and be real. One of the things that Leader Treks also talks a lot about is push kids 10% out of their comfort zone. Um, if you push too far, and it's just an arbitrary number, right? Like you, It's not like you walk up to students and go, yo. You 15% out or is it like eight? You okay? Um, they don't know. But you push 10%. If you push too hard, they're overwhelmed. And if kids get overwhelmed, they shut down. If you're not challenging them, um, then they're just kind of like, what's my purpose here? And that's what I was starting to see in kids that went on the youth work trips. They just got used to, okay, I'm painting a wall. But they didn't have anything that was really challenging them. Um, being in charge, you could go to the same location. We rotate Leader Trek sites. Um, but you could go to the same location every year. And with a Leader Trek level three team, it would be different every year because you'd have two student leaders and your kids would have different responsibilities and it would be new challenges for them. So what does it look like to push your kids 10% out of their comfort zone? Um, they also, when we went on our first trip, um, their staff, so they typically have a trip leader and then at least one intern. I was amazed by how well their staff got to know my students. Um, and they were having really important questions with, like conversations with them. I remember we were working in a community garden trying to lay um, like concrete. And... <laughs> Um, one of their staff was talking to this kid named Max, um, who was passionate about baseball, played baseball um, in high school on his team, did a lot with that. And he was asking Max how he was going to help um, guys on his team get to know Christ. I had known Max for like two or three years and had never had a conversation like that with Max. And I was like, you have known him for like three days. Like... How are you having this conversation with him? 
And so what they train their staff in is this um, concept of 100 questions. So you will find as you talk with teens that their favorite subject is often themselves. Right? Um, and so you observe what they're interested in. So imagine if I am a student and I walk into a room, you don't know me, and I'm wearing a San Antonio Spurs shirt because I'm a big fan. Your question could be, well, hey, what's your name? Nice to meet you. Um, so you like the Spurs? And I'd be like, yeah. You could be like, sweet. And we're done. <laughs> but if you keep asking questions, they often will continue to share. Now there's some kids that are shy or you know you got to be sensitive to how they're feeling but hey you like the spurs yeah how long have you liked the spurs oh since eighth grade what was it about eighth grade that you started cheering for them oh well i got this picture i got this christian magazine um that had david robinson on the cover and i just thought he was like an incredibly strong man of god full of faith um, and he was a good basketball player I just thought it was fun and then a couple months later there was an article on Avery Johnson in the same magazine and he was their point guard and I was just like dude these guys are awesome and so I started cheering for them so you've been cheering for them since then like how old are you now 42 you are an old kid <laughs> um, but you can keep asking questions like so like have you gone to any games um, does anyone else in your family like them Oh, well, I've not been to any games, but um, I think I'd love to go with my dad sometime. He was born in San Antonio. Oh, that's awesome. Um, how long did your dad live in San Antonio? I think he was only there a couple years. Um, well, what's your relationship with your dad like? Like, you've gone from a simple thing that they are wearing to what's their relationship with their dad look like? Just because you're intentionally asking questions. And that is not, this is hard, but that is not, okay, I'm not really listening to you because I'm thinking of my next question. Because if you're doing that, you have no clue what they just said. So you're listening. What's going on? What did you just say? What's a natural question I can ask? So I train all of my adults who help in student ministry to do this. Um, similar to I've just talked to you about it. So the more you practice this, the more you will see, hey, I can get into really beneficial conversations just by asking questions. Um, the last thing before I tar start talking about how we've implemented some of this is Bible study methods. So I have over here, if you want to look, I have some of their field guides. And we use these for our junior hires as well. We do a local um, mission trip, and I use these. Um, but what these field guides, trip books teach, um, is different Bible study methods. So they give students 45 minutes in the morning. And you kind of go, whoa, you're going to give my 8th or ninth grader 45 minutes by themselves to do Bible study? Um, they try to fill it for those kids. So, like I'll, day four here, they have this. You're going to go through like James 3, and it's got questions. Um, this method is the newspaper method. Um, and so you're just reading the passage and then answering the questions. Right? So let's say that takes 10 minutes, maybe, for some kids. Um, next, they have a prayer journal where it's the Acts prayer method, so they can spend some time in prayer. They also have a personal growth journal. How am I doing? What is life looking like? What am I learning out of this trip, etc., that they can fill out? What I have found is that when you give them 45 minutes and you give them specific Bible study methods, they go home and they can use those same methods. Like um, the 5P method, I wonder if I can find it. OPA, we'll talk about that one. OPA method is observation, principles, and application. So I'm going to read this passage, James chapter 2, and I'm going to compile all the facts I can find about it. That can take a while. Then what are some principles that I can draw out of that? Like what am I seeing? What connections am I seeing? What, what principles for my life can I see? And then how am I going to apply that? And they always have application in their Bible studies. And so what I found was when we would go on youth works trips, um, the devotionals were very engaging. It was great. But the kids would never look at it again. It was like, oh, that was good. That was meaningful. Um, but with this, I started having kids say, I, I think I want to spend some more time with Jesus just while I'm home and I think I want to I'm going to use some of these Bible study methods and so I have found that especially as kids get more experience with having 45 minutes as they are sophomores, juniors seniors, they start craving that they go, one of my favorite parts of trip 
is just having time with Jesus. And they come home as a freshman and they say, oh man, I have learned um, so much. I love spending time with Jesus. And they do it semi-good for like two weeks after. But by the time they are juniors and seniors and they have had that struggle of going and showing up and failing, and man, I haven't read my Bible in two months. As juniors and seniors, those who are really engaged and committed start going, I'm going to find a way to work this in all the time because they have experienced the fruit of it. And so I would definitely say encouraging students to spend 45 minutes is a challenge. But how are we supposed to equip our kids as disciples and leaders if they are not spending time with Jesus? And how are we supposed to do that if we are not spending time with Jesus? And so it's been a huge healthy challenge for me and one of the things that I love too. Um, And I actually do this, um, I I typically spend at least 30 minutes if not 45 um, in quiet time every day when I first get to church because I realize how important it is for me to be fed with my time with Jesus. So how have I implemented some of this stuff? Um, We have instituted something we call the steps of progression. So understanding that we don't want to push push kids too far. During confirmation, we require them to do 40 hours of community service in the summer. I don't care how much you do outside of that. Um, You could do a bunch during the school year, but in the summer... As a junior high student, you have to do 40 hours. And then we say, you want to get all that done in one week? Join us for our service week. And so we do a local mission trip. We don't do overnights. You show up at like 7 every day. We do 30 minutes of quiet time with the junior hires with those same trip books. We take 15 or 20 minutes afterwards to process the Bible study. Um, And then they go different locations and serve. And students are in charge of stuff, even in junior high. So there's a a small private Christian school in Denver that every year we go on Wednesday. And so Tuesday afternoon of our week, our students plan two hours of VBS. So it's less than what they do on mission trip, right? But it's, okay, we're doing this tomorrow. What Bible study do we want to do? What craft are we doing? We talk about what theme do we want to have. We discuss it as a large group. They get split up into teams. They plan a couple crafts. They plan a couple game times. They plan a couple Bible stories. They don't have enough time to get nervous about it because it's the next day. Um, We go to Walmart or we look in the, we raid children's ministry. Don't tell Katie. Um, We get craft supplies. um, And then we go do it. And what we have found is They experience that in junior high, Um, and we always do a um, mission trip like recap service um, at the end of the summer. And so all our students, they're wearing their t-shirts, we have three student speakers, they lead the whole service, and those student speakers talk about what they learned on mission trip. So kids that have been attending for three or four years, they're like, I can't wait to go on mission trip. But they experience it in junior high. Then they do a level two where they're in charge of VBS. And then for those who want more responsibility, they do the level three trip where they're in charge of everything. Um, This summer is the first summer ever. Um, It's the second summer we've had three mission teams. And it is the second, it's the first summer ever that we have two level three teams. Most of our freshmen um, and a lot of, like almost all of our underclassmen want to go on a level three. And most of the time they get an opportunity to go on a level two in eighth grade. We open up mission trips in eighth grade. So we have a lot more eighth graders now saying, we want to go on a level two as an eighth grader. And now they're saying they want to do level three, even as freshmen. They're hungry for the opportunity to step into meaningful work. Um, I have tried to start some leadership teams. We've done this three different years. Um, And then there was some change in leadership at my church um, and I haven't ever gotten back to having leadership, student leadership teams. But we ran three different types over three different years. I started out doing monthly meetings where they plan the event themselves. Like, hey, decide an event you want to run. You guys are in charge of it. Um, And that was the spring break uh, ski trip. That did not go well. Um, And I realized probably meeting monthly, they're just not meeting enough. Like, I I have to get them 
connected more quickly. So the next year I was like, let's just have them plan service projects. I had three or four kids that were really passionate and I said, why don't you guys plan two or three service projects for us to do throughout the whole year? Um, I think we also did monthly meetings maybe, or maybe we met sooner, but they only planned one. Um, then we switched the third year to a personal event. So um, one of the things that LeaderTrex has is this book, Student Leaders Start Here. I bought one for each of my students. It has assessments in here. First off, they do a simple assessment um, where they figure out, am I a doer, thinker, relater, or mover? That's just the personality types that they use. Um, but understanding your team, um, how they work together, how you are wired is important. They also have a spiritual gift assessment in here. You can do that and understand that as well. They also have... Um, ba this balancing act. They have Bible studies and stuff in here. They talk about the five skills and the traits. Um, they have scripture. They have another assessment in here too. I'm trying to find it. They have uh, something for character assessment that they can rate themselves and how they do some of the stuff. They can have a parent assess them. They can have me as the youth worker assess them. But So we've used this and the assessments to kind of help students understand how are you wired. Um, they also have a curriculum. Um, this is six years worth. So if you are connected to a school in some way, shape, or form where you want to teach leadership, um, you could have, I guess, two years of junior high and then four of high school. Um, and I've bought some of that stuff just because I wanted to pull from some of their other resources for our student leadership meetings. So what I did was we met three weeks in a row. Let's just pound it out in like September. We're going to do three weeks. So you have this topic. We're going to meet Sunday afternoons, get this done, and once we've done that, then you are going to prayerfully consider what are you passionate about and how you can help. So the year I did that, I had four students participating. One um, enjoyed graphic design, and so he took over our um, advertisements on Instagram. So each week, I would say, hey, this is what's going on, and he would build the new picture and send it to me, and I would post it. So that was his. Um, we had another guy who was passionate about student-led worship. And so he planned a, he wanted to do it monthly. I think we had him do it two or three times because I knew it was going to take some time to ramp up to it. Um, but he was in charge of the whole thing. So he got a, he tried to get a band together. He had a student speaker. Um, he, he met in a different space in our church. He built this whole backdrop. He put like colored lights all over it. I was like, dang, like this is way more than I would have ever done. Um, but it was great because it was his baby and he was encouraging students to come, finding speakers or he was speaking, um, having student led worship, etc. Had another girl um, who was really passionate about quiet time, stuff that she had learned on her leader trex trips. And so she just wanted to do a Devo for the rest of the students on why it was important. And so she led a Devo for our students. Um, there was another girl who was really ambitious and wanted to do an anti-bullying campaign at her school. It was a great idea and did not come to fruition. There's a lot of stuff to work through with that. Um, but so that's how I've done student leadership teams. I think 